My name is Andrew Clavin, and this is a story I wrote called Another Kingdom, performed by Michael Knowles. Today, in episode one, suddenly I was in a stone room hung with tapestries. There was a woman lying on the floor. She was beautiful and she was dead. There was a bloody gash in her gown right below her breasts. There was blood in a pool all around her. And there was blood on the dagger I was holding in my hand. Another Kingdom, Episode 1. No one is told any story but his own. C.S. Lewis. The truth is, by the time everything went crazy, I was pretty much crazy already. Edgy, anxious, hypochondriacal. I hardly recognized myself. I mean, there was a time I used to be somebody. Not somebody famous, just a dude, but somebody. I used to be able to look in the mirror and say, that's me, that's Austin Lively. Now, I was lost in a dark wood. Hollywood, haha. I'd been told that Hollywood was where you went if you wanted to sell your soul to make movies. I went, but I never sold my soul. No one would buy it. I just got tired of carrying it around. I did sell a script once, right out of film school. A daring, original, deeply personal take on the sci-fi epics that were all the rage. Three Days in Forever, it was called. I sold Three Days in Forever to one of the major studios, then spent the next two years in development meetings with producers and studio executives. You ever see jackals gutting the carcass of a once beautiful gazelle? That's what the development meetings were like. My script was the gazelle. The producers and executives were the jackals. I was the asshole. The movie never got made. After that, I wrote a script my agent couldn't sell. Then I wrote a script my agent wouldn't sell. Then, then came that day when either I went berserk or the world did, or we both went berserk together. I still don't know which. I slumped into Hitchcock's cafe that morning wearing my sorrows like a thundercloud hat. Hitchcock's was a no-ho tavern of stained wood and white fairy lights. Far to your left as you come in. Liquor bottles glittering green and white and brown red with the light from the flat screen where the TV news was flickering. Tables to your right. Hollywood hopefuls nursing coffee over their laptops. Posters from old suspense films hung on the walls here and there. Glamorous stars of the 40s and 50s making fearful faces with images of danger surrounding them. Speeding trains and gunmen and heroes dangling from the Statue of Liberty's lamp. Somehow, the antique one-sheets gave the place an arty glamour. There was my crew at the long table by the restroom door. Wannabes, sellouts, and hangers-on. Oh, my. Not a one of them older than 33, and all of them gone so wrong, so young. They were picking at their muffins and yogurts and coffee and reading the postings on their handheld devices. Not one of them saying a word. Not even hello as I plunked down among them. Only Jane... Jane Janeway bothered to smile, but then she was in love with me. Jane was mousy, slump-shouldered, shy, but she could have been beautiful. She had a slim, graceful figure, a sweet, gentle, oval face. She played her looks way down by wearing schlumpy clothes and too little makeup and by letting her long, straight hair hang in limp brown strands. That way, see, she never upstaged Alexis Merriweather, the spectacularly gorgeous movie star she worked for. And she never tempted David Thune, the also spectacularly gorgeous movie star who was Alexis's husband. Dave Exus, the tabloids called the couple. Jane Janeway worked as their personal assistant, Reed Slave. Ted Wexler, sitting next to her, was assistant to a literary agent. Ted aspired to be a sleazy, unctuous dirtbag like his boss, and it looked like he had a fine career of it ahead of him. Ren Yen, across from him, was a Eurasian stunner, tall and lean and only 20. I'm not sure I ever heard her speak, but the corners of her mouth lifted expressively sometimes. She worked reception at a public relations office while auditioning for acting and modeling jobs. Chad Valentine was a short, slim, aspiring actor of the boyishly brooding type. Dark hair, soulful eyes, long, vaguely feminine, vaguely seductive features. I never knew what he did for money. 
I'm not sure I wanted to know. Skylar Cohen was the waitress, a large, buxom woman ballooning the unofficial Hitchcock black t-shirt, black skirt, and black tights. She was 30 or thereabouts, short, spiky red hair, and a face at once cherubic and furious. She was trying to be a comic, working open mic nights at clubs, slinging jokes about what pigs men are. Like all comics, she was angry and miserable. I never met one who wasn't. She smacked my coffee mug down in front of me like a hanging judge's gavel. Skylar hated me, because she actually kind of liked me. But she loved Jane Janeway, who let her live in her house, but wasn't interested in her because she was interested in me. It was complicated. I lifted the mug to my lips and stared bleakly through the steam. What a bunch, I said bitterly. Staring at our devices, we don't even look at each other anymore. Ted Wexler raised his eyes from his handheld and studied me. I'm looking at you. You look like shit. Chad and Ren Yen gave me a curious glance. Ren nodded. Wow, said Chad. Almost exactly like shit. Skylar paused in tidying up the crumbs around Jane's granola, took a look for herself. The resemblance is uncanny. Jane, tender-hearted Jane, started to say, cut it out, you guys. But then she saw me too and said, oh, wow. What the hell happened to you, said Skylar. My sigh rippled the black surface of my coffee. I heard from my agent, I said. He didn't like your new script, said Jane. Oh, is this going to be one of those Hollywood failure stories, said Wex. I love those, said Chad. They make me feel so much better about my life. He fired me, I said. Oh, Austin, said Jane. She put a consoling hand on my arm, which made me feel even worse. He can't fire you, said Wexler. He works for you. He told me I needed to find an agent who was a better fit. Wow, said Wexler. He fired you. The script must have really blown the big whistle. Must have sucked the hairy straw. Must have eaten the Ted, said Jane. What? Just saying. But that was exactly the problem. The script had, in fact, eaten whatever it was Ted was about to say it had eaten. It was a terrible script, cliched and lifeless. The work of a cynical no-talent trying to play to the market. I think I had talent once. I must have. All those awards I won in film school. But failure had beaten the vision out of me. I'd gotten so I'd do anything to avoid the ghouly punch of rejection. I used to consult my muse before deciding what project to work on. Nowadays, I consulted the box office charts. I would call my agent, my former agent, and ask him, what are the buyers looking for? Zombies? Spaceships? Superheroes? Great. I have this idea about a superhero on a spaceship full of zombies. I'm really excited about it. I think you're going to like it. So the script was crap. I knew it. After I sent the final draft to my agent, I immediately caught a cold that lasted six weeks. When the cold cleared up and my agent still hadn't called, I sank into a depression so bad I finally had to take myself to a psychiatrist. She said I had a chemical imbalance and gave me a prescription for some pills. I filled the prescription and read the label. Possible side effects, impotence and constipation. I hadn't been with a woman for three months, but I did still go to the bathroom sometimes. So I flushed the pills down the toilet. Chemical imbalance my ass. For the next two weeks, I sat in my room with the lights out and waited for my agent to call and reject the script as it deserved. I wasn't expecting him to fire me, though. Life retained its capacity to surprise. Hey, look, said Chad, lifting his chin toward the bar behind me. Isn't that your famous and successful brother on TV? Oh, man, said Wexler. That's got to make you feel like shit, doesn't it? You already look like shit, but that Ted said Jane Jane away. What? Just saying. I looked over my shoulder at the flat screen behind the bar. And yes, there was my famous and successful brother, all right, with his great handsome head and his Viking beard and his swept back golden hair and his broad shouldered frame in his three piece suit and his PhD in comparative sociology from Harvard and the title of his latest best selling book on the Chiron, Creating Equality, and his name. Dr. Richard Lively, Orozco Institute. And yes, it did make me feel like shit. Almost exactly. The resemblance was uncanny.
When I left Hitchcock's, I drove to Global Studios. I had a freelance job there as a story analyst. A story analyst is a fancy name for a reader. He reads things on assignment, books, screenplays, articles. For each thing he reads, he writes a summary and gives his opinion about why it would or would not make a good movie. This is called coverage. His boss reads the coverage, and then he can pretend he read the book or the screenplay and has an opinion about it. I'm sure my agent had a reader read my script before he fired me. I'm sure he didn't read it himself. No one reads in Hollywood except readers, like me. My brother Richard had gotten me this freelance gig when the money from my script sale ran out. I had called him in a humiliating panic. I'm broke. I don't know what to do. My brother put me on hold for about three minutes. Then he came back on and told me I had a reader job at Mythos, a production company. My brother could do that because Mythos had a deal with Global Studios and Serge Orozco, the billionaire who funded my brother's think tank, also owned Global, not to mention major newspapers, television stations, and publishing houses around the world. Richard and Serge were pals. I drove to the studio in my eight-year-old Nissan, a sputtering, blunt, scratched, and dented piece of scrap on wheels. A car in L.A. is like an accent in England. It instantly reveals everything about you. My Nissan sputtered along a freeway streaked with the afterimages of the sleek, low-slung racers that were flashing past me, each as quick as a dismissive glance. A picture came into my mind as I drove, a wistful memory that returned to me often these days. I was a little boy, maybe five or six or so. I was sitting on the floor in the back room of our house in Berkeley. My father and mother were professors at the university there. They were in the next room over, the living room. My brother was with them. He was seven years older than I was, so maybe 12 or 13. The three of them were discussing books and big ideas, their lock-jawed drawls thick with a tone of intellectual superiority. My little sister Riley, only two or three, had vanished into a long storage space hidden behind a sliding wall panel. She liked to crawl around in there and then return to tell long-winded stories about the secret hiding holes she'd found. But I... I was aware of none of them. I was completely immersed in an imaginative universe of my own. I was arranging plastic figures against a backdrop I'd made out of colored paper taped to a cardboard box. Space knights and alien monsters and villainous galactic tyrants were doing battle in front of my crayon drawing of starry darkness. I whispered their dialogue to myself as I moved them into their various positions, creating tableau, acting out scenes, making movies of the mind. And there was within me a stillness of complete delight. I remembered it, as if in the act of creation, my brainwaves had arranged themselves into their native patterns, and my flesh was speaking the silent language of my original spirit. Delight, delight, creation and delight. Where had the purity of that impulse gone? Where had that original spirit gone? What had this city done to me? What had I done to myself? The Global Pictures studio lot was a white-walled fortress that rose out of the long, dismal storefront flatlands of Melrose Avenue. The main entrance was the famous Da Vinci Gate, a victory arch of golden marble topped with elaborate iron filigree, a Rococo relic of the industry's golden age. I thought of the two-toned Rolls-Royce phantoms that once carried actors through that gate into immortality. My Nissan farted pitiably as it idled on a line of Beamers and Teslas, waiting to enter. It was autumn. A cool and sunny day. I parked in one of the spaces near the gate and walked past sound stages, barracks as large as dinosaurs. Some had their enormous doors open, and I peeked in as I passed at the fake interiors of TV shows. A police precinct, a suburban home, a set of law offices. I always liked being on the lot. It made me feel like I was still part of the city's glamorous enterprise. And how pathetic was that? Like the guy who shovels out the elephant pen at the circus. Maybe you should get a better job. What, and leave show business? The production company was in the Edison Building, a long four-story barn of yellow brick circa 1930. 
Inside, I walked through a maze of identical hallways, past identical office doors, and up sudden stairways that led to other hallways and other doors equally identical. Mythos was on floor three, a flashy modern suite of offices once you pushed through the Depression-era door. Posters decorated the walls behind the cubicles. One-sheets from the films they'd made, most of them in the Captain Samurai superhero franchise, a big-money series of comic book tentpoles about a young man whose zen powers of something gave him the ability to something, 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 who the hell cares? Captain Samurai. Captain Samurai Vengeance. Captain Samurai Apocalypse. Captain Samurai Origins, the reboot, and so on. My boss, the story editor, Candy Fillican, was on a call when I arrived. So said her assistant, a willowy boy named Ken with a face so bland it could have been featureless. He gave me a bottle of water, and I sat and waited in the chair beside his desk. Waited and waited. Twenty minutes. Twenty-five. Staring, hypnotized at the posters. Thinking what utter schlock these samurai pictures were, and how I would have sold my soul to have a screen credit on any one of them. I remembered myself. A little boy sitting on the floor, laying out stories with my figures creation, and delight. Finally, Ken said, Andy is ready for you. She was sleek and smart and pretty in an adamant sort of way, sable hair just so, and bright brown eyes just so, and nose just so, and her smile and her gym-toned figure and her khaki pantsuit all business sharp. She shook my hand when I came into her office, and her hand was cool and dry. She sat in the big armchair in front of her desk, poised and confident, her legs crossed at the knee. I sat on the sofa in front of her, sinking deep into the cushions so that I felt small, a supplicant. Candy asked me if I had made any discoveries this week, if any of the scripts and novels I'd read might provide movie material for mythos. I snorted in answer. Candy, I said, sometimes, I swear, reading this crap day after day, I feel like a psychiatrist in hell, like I'm listening to the twisted fantasies of damned souls whose last desperate hope for redemption is to transform their perverse imaginings into something like a story. So that would be no, said Candy with a mirthless laugh, a laugh that said she knew me, knew exactly who I was, had seen a hundred smart-ass never was like me in this job, and would see a hundred more before she beat the odds and made executive. I was out of her office in five minutes, out again in the maze-like halls, my thundercloud funk hat now settling down to embrace the whole of me, a thunderfunk shroud. Swathed in the brown fog of it, lost in gloomy thought, I lectured myself. I should give it up, this dream of Hollywood success. I should go to law school like my mother wanted, get a PhD like my father said, get out of the business, Austin Lively, before you wake up one day and you're 50 and you've never done anything but sit around coffee shops whining that the movies are no good anymore while other men make movies, creation and delight. It was at this point that I looked up and realized I was lost. Lost in the Edison building. I wasn't sure which of the identical hallways I was in or which of the identical doors I was in front of or even what floor I was on. I read the plaques on the wall. Netherway Pictures. Perdita Productions, Jess Neufeld and Company. I'd never heard of any of them. Had I gone down a flight of stairs? I couldn't remember. I didn't see a stairway anywhere. How was I supposed to get out of here? There was a door at the end of the hall. I figured that was my best bet. A stairwell, probably. I went to it quickly, feeling like an idiot. I tried the knob. It turned easily. I pushed it open and stepped through. I let out a frightened shout, fighting for balance. Suddenly, I was on the edge of a tremendous drop at the ledge of a high window. Blue sky swirled above me, filled with stone towers and conical roofs in tilted confusion. Something sparkled and spun through the air beneath me, toward the sparkling water far below. There was noise behind me, thundering footsteps, shouts. My arm flew out for balance as I staggered back from the ledge. I turned around, I looked around, stunned, confused. I was in a stone room hung with tapestries. There was a woman on the floor in a pool of blood. The woman was beautiful and she was dead. She was 20 at most, 
with round cheeks and a noble brow and golden hair spilling round her face like a halo. She was stretched out on the cold gray stone and clothed in a long, elegant gown of some fine white material. There was a bloody gash in the fabric right below her breasts. Blood stained her bodice. There was blood in a pool all around her. And there was blood on the dagger, the dagger I was holding in my hand. There was blood dripping off the point of it onto the slab between my feet. Someone started pounding on the door. Maybe I should have tried to escape or thought to drop the knife or thought something, but I couldn't think at all. I couldn't understand what I was seeing, how I was seeing it, what was happening to me, where I was. Had I wandered onto a movie set? And the knife in my hand, what the fuck? I looked around in an idiot daze. Someone was still pounding insistently at the door, and yet my eyes roamed stupidly over the tapestries on the wall. Torches flamed in the spaces between them, the wavering light giving life to elegant medieval scenes of reapers in fields, huntsmen on horseback, Gentlemen and ladies dancing daintily, hand in hand. The pounding, pounding, pounding at the heavy wooden door seemed far away and unreal. Then the wood tore with a terrible cracking noise and the door burst in. A small army of men flooded the room. Men in black leather and chain mail. Men with drawn swords that flashed in the flame light from the torches. Oh God, she's dead! One of them shouted. I stared at them, my mouth open. I thought this had to be over in a moment. It was some kind of hallucination, that's all. In another moment, everything would be normal again. The men, there were six of them, parted into two groups of three as a seventh man came in behind them and pushed to the front. He was obviously the leader, tall and fit and broad and ramrod straight, black-haired and black-bearded. He wore a red vest with a gold dragon embroidered on it. He wore a sword in the scabbard on his hip, he wore an ironic expression of disdain for the world. He looked handsome and bold. His eyes went down to the dead woman, then up to me. He sneered. You son of a bitch, he said. Without thinking, because what could I think? What the fuck was happening to me? I gestured at him with the dagger in my hand. He must have thought I was going to attack him. In a movement too swift to see, he drew his sword and swept it at me in a casually brutal arc. The flat of the heavy blade smacked into the side of my head. My mind seemed to go flying out of my body and then snap back into it and sink down and down into a murky distance inside me. The room, the men, the world all accordioned away, far away. My eyes rolled up in opposite directions. I felt my legs turn to jelly. The dagger dropped from my limp fingers and fell twirling to the floor. I wilted down after it. The next thing I knew, I was dimly aware that two men were holding me, one gripping me under each arm. They were dragging me thump, thump, thump down a torch-lit stairway, my legs trailing limp, my toes bumping along behind me. There was blood in my eyes, on my cheek. I shook my head, trying to clear it. I tried to speak, but my jaw hung slack, I heard myself groaning. We reached the bottom of the stairs. I struggled to get my feet under me. I managed to stumble along as the two guards hurried me onward by force. My head started to pulse with pain. Real pain, no hallucination. As if a big pain balloon were blowing up and deflating inside me, filling me with fresh pain each time. It was awful. My mouth still hanging open, I looked around. I caught glimpses of an underground labyrinth of dirt and stone. A third guard was striding ahead of us, leading the way. Corridors ran off left and right under morbid archways. Heavy iron doors were set, here and there, deep in the hued rock. Torches flamed and flickered in sconces on the wall, set far enough apart so that the jittery shadows melded into brooding darkness between them. The air stank of shit and despair. What's happening, I tried to say. Where am I? But the words came out blurry like words in a dream. Shell up, the lead guard shouted. There was a loud clank of metal. Hinges creaked, the sound echoing off the vaulted ceiling. A door swung open somewhere. I wasn't sure where. My head lolled on my shoulder as if it would come loose and fall off. My vision rolled sickeningly. 
I caught sight of fire, a torch nearer, brighter than the others. I managed to turn toward it. I saw a horrid, insectile little man, the jailer. He was no more than four feet tall, his bent and scrawny frame swimming in a worn gray robe. His head was cowled, but I could see the warty, bug-eyed and absurdly beak-nosed face grinning weirdly out of the folds of the cloth. He held his wildly flaming torch aloft in his left hand. In his right hand, he held a ring of enormous keys. The keys clanked and jingled as he walked toward us. Who's this? he said. He had a voice like a rusted machine, slow and creaky. His name is Austin Lively, said the lead guard. I blinked, shocked, because that was my name, my actual name. How could it be? How could he know me? How could I be here? How could this be happening? He's charged with the murder of Lady Katapalav. Even with my brain befogged and rattled, those horrible words shocked some speech out of me. I struggled weakly in the grip of the guards. Murder? I shouted. Are you fucking nuts? I didn't kill anyone. I don't even know what's happening. I don't know where I am. The words came out slurred, thick, indistinct. No one paid any attention. It was as if I'd made no sound at all. The jailer started down a corridor, muttering to himself and giggling, flipping through the keys on his ring. Quick and pigeon-toed, he skittered like a roach. The guards frog-marched me after him. We passed under a brick arch. I turned from one guard to another, one stony, indifferent face to another, trying to tell them it was all a mistake, trying to push the thick words past my thick tongue. No one even glanced at me. The jailer moved to one of the iron doors. The latch gave a hollow thunk as he unlocked it. The hinges groaned as he hauled the door open. A thick stench poured out of the deeper darkness in the cell beyond. Something within that hellhole gave a deep animal huff of rage and hunger. My eyes went wide. This was real. This was really real. And now the guards were dragging me toward the cell's open doorway. The jailer stood back and watched, grinning with sadistic pleasure, holding his torch to light the way, his warty face hideous in the wavering flames. Terror went off inside me now like a bomb. I tried to dig my heels into the dirt and stone of the floor, tried to stop the guards from dragging me into that cell, locking me in with whatever was in there. Stop! Listen to me! This is a mistake! I didn't do anything! I don't belong here! I had no chance. The guards were big men, much stronger than I was, and I was still weak and dazed from the blow to my head and from the shock of finding myself in this impossible place. They overpowered me easily, forced me past the grinning jailer, forced me over the threshold, hustled me over the dirt floor as I struggled, hurled me face first into the cell wall. I grunted as I hit the stone. Still, I spun around to try to fight but one guard pressed his sword point hard into the hollow of my throat, making me gag, pinning me. The other guards grabbed my arms and snapped manacles around my wrist. What are you doing? I shouted. Stop! It's a mistake! I'm a story analyst! Too late. I was chained to the wall. It all happened in a second. Then the three guards stood aside, and I saw the monster. I had never heard myself scream before. Not really, not like this. It just broke out of me, beyond my control. Across the cell, lit by the dancing orange flames of the jailer's torch, stood a massive and uncanny creature, savage, brutal, and utterly grotesque. It was at least twice as tall as the biggest guard, and huge at the center, its torso a great ball of meaty flesh. It had arms the size of a bull's haunches and stout, short legs bulging with muscle. It wore nothing but a filthy rag around its loins, and its flesh was covered everywhere with thick, curling, filthy hair. Its face, horrible, shaped like a squashed boulder with the wide, bloody, fanged mouth of a shark, a bulbous, streaming nose the size of a softball, and one eye, one immense and dreadful eye smack in the center of its forehead. 
I would not have believed that a single eye could contain such depths of ferocity, such a rage for bloodshed and destruction, and it was staring straight at me. The thing was in a frenzy, struggling against its chains, sending up a sort of squealing roar that spiraled up from one height of fury to the next. Its daggery teeth snapped and flashed as it tried to get at me. The lead guard shared a laugh with the others. You don't want to get too close to him, he advised me with a smile. He'll take your head off with a single bite. I gaped at the creature. I couldn't take my eyes off him. Listen, I said hoarsely to the guard. You can't leave me in here with that thing. This is all a mistake. The guards all laughed some more, and the jailer laughed, trying to be one of them. Showing off, he stuck his torch in the monster's face, taunting it, tormenting it, while it squealed and snapped at him, roared and strained. Oh, no! You've had your share of heads in this lifetime, ogre, he said to it, trying to impress the guards. You're going to entertain the crowds by dying slow. The monster squealed and bared its fangs and pulled so hard on its chains, I saw dust fly from the walls where the chains were anchored. My heart seized in fear that the anchoring rings would come free. All right said the lead guard. That's enough. Leave him alone. Let's go. The jailer gave a satisfied snigger. He lowered his torch from the ogre's face. The guards headed for the door. They were leaving me, leaving me here with that thing. I shouted at them, wait, staring at the beast who stared back at me with his single eye as he raged and wrenched his bonds. This had to be insanity. It had to be. It couldn't be happening, but it was. It was. Wait! The guards marched out. The jailer grinned at me one last time, then followed them. The cell's iron door slammed shut. This has been Another Kingdom by Andrew Claven, performed by Michael Knowles.